In 1915, a group of women gathered in Europe to try and find a way to stop World War I. It was the birth of the oldest women's peace organization in the world, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. This is their story. The end of the Victorian age and the beginning of the 20th century brought about a flood of movement for social change. Many people began actively struggling for control over their own lives. Settlement communities, labor unions, and civil liberties organizations all grew out of this tremendous and dynamic period. Women were profoundly involved in all these movements, as well as fighting for their own rights. These feminists became formidable opponents to the male-dominated world of the early 1900s. Mildred Scott Olmsted has been a member of the Women's International League since 1921. She has held a variety of positions in the League, including Executive Director of the United States Section. I grew up a strong feminist because I grew up in a Victorian-type family. And I say grew up my first 10 years in a Victorian-type family in which the, my father was the head of the house and you weren't supposed to ask him questions. If you asked things, it was because I say so. And my, this was the way my mother's position was, too. And I resented it very much. And so I went to college as believing in suffrage. In 1915, the fight for women's suffrage was gaining momentum. Despite barriers of distance and of language, voteless women across the world became united in the struggle for equality. As early as 1902, an international suffrage alliance had been formed to strengthen these links. They planned to hold one of their international congresses in Berlin in 1915. But World War I intervened. But when the war broke out, I followed Woodrow Wilson into believing, very naive, of course, which I was, and so were most people, uh, in believing it was a war to end war to make the world safe for democracy and all those beautiful slogans. Women responded in a great variety of ways to the outbreak of the war. Some although they opposed their government's position on women, supported the decision to participate in the war. Other women were angered at the way their countries were caught up in war-crazed jingoism. They felt that they had been dragged into a conflict in which they had no voice, and they thought the war was wrong. These differences were the cause of what would become a permanent split in the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. After the war, Mildred Olmsted went overseas to do relief work. Later, she began working with the American Friends Service Committee. And friends invited me to work with them, and I went up into Nor Grand Prairie area, northern France, the devastated region. And there I got all the other side, what the war had meant to these peasants, to these people living there. Uh, some of them, they were coming back, you see, and they couldn't even find the houses the whole tops of hills had been shot away. The people were living caved in houses and they were living down in the ground floor. The wells had been poisoned. Uh, we were right on the edge of a battlefield uh, and all the obstruction was still there. And the prisoners of war, the prisoners of war camp, were assigned to help these French families uh, rebuild, try to rebuild. And you would go into the homes of these uh, families and there they would have sitting down with them, eating with them, that food they had, sharing them with the prisoner or the German who had been helping them. And you would say, but this is a, this is a prisoner, this is a German, and he's your enemy. And they would very, you know, Germans are bad people, but not this boy. He's a nice boy. He's nice. So I saw what happened when people were put together and working together. And I came to realize how much the people were exploited by the government. Uh, then we were sent down into Bavaria, and there we saw what starvation was. You can't imagine what it's like. In the First World War, Germany was not destroyed, uh, but 
they were starved. Uh, and everywhere, food was stolen. Everything, honestly, was stolen food. You can't imagine what it was like. You'd see a big crowd looking in at the window with just a little dried up cheese and a couple of pieces of ham or something in there to go through. But there I saw the other side of it. Uh, and it was really there that I first heard of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom because the German section, the women in that, came and offered their services to help us as volunteers in the distribution of the food. Uh, as a result, we became very good friends with Gertrude Baer and her co-workers, and they began asking us, uh, what are the women in America doing for peace? Why did Mrs. Cat desert us? And I had no idea what they were talking about. And through her and that group, who we used to see in the evenings and so on, uh, they told us about how the women had met at The Hague in 1915, women from both sides of the line who were opposed to the war and wanted to end the war and right away, and who wanted to appeal to the governments and had appealed to all the governments, including the neutral and the belligerent governments, to stop the war before there was more destruction and try to negotiate. From the onset of war, Many women who had previously worked together through the International Suffrage Alliance tried to maintain ties. To our German sisters, some of us wish to send you a word at this sad Christmas tide. Those of us who wish for peace may surely offer a solemn greeting to such of you who feel as we do. Though our sons are sent to slay each other and our hearts are torn by the cruelty of this fate, yet through pain supreme we will be true to our common womanhood. Saddened and angered by what the war was doing to their lives, they looked to each other for support, sympathy, and for a way out of the horror they were experiencing. Aletta Jacobs was the first woman doctor in Holland and the leader of the Dutch women's suffrage movement. She, along with other European women, thought that it was more important than ever for them to maintain the solidarity that they felt with each other as women above that of nationality. They sent out a call to meet in April of 1915 at The Hague, and then they began organizing the International Congress of Women. It was one thing for women to accept the invitation to the Congress, and quite another for them to actually reach Holland. Many had been denied passports by their governments. Others simply could not pass through areas where the war was raging. Women traveling to the Congress not only battled minefields, but also the ridicule and scorn of their governments and communities. There were 300 delegates from 12 nations who attended the Congress. 1,300 people packed the large hall for three days. The difficult task of chairing the meeting went to Jane Addams of the United States. None could fail to admire the courage and spirit of these women from enemy countries who embraced and exchanged experiences with one another. Some of the women of the Hague Congress were great suffrage leaders. Others were labor leaders, teachers, housewives. In those three days, despite the confusion of translations, they worked side by side, disagreed, and compromised. By the end of the Congress, they formulated a plan for neutral mediation of the war and laid down a detailed and specific program to maintain a permanent peace after the war. The Congress voted that the resolution should be carried by envoys to the various governments of Europe and to the President of the United States. Their plan, though well received, was not acted upon by any government until 1918, when many of their ideas were incorporated by Woodrow Wilson into the 14 points for the armistice. The women of the Hague Congress formed the International Committee of Women for Permanent Peace, which in 1919 officially became known as the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Still shocked by the massive destruction of World War I, people began to organize and mobilize, looking for ways to keep the peace and to investigate new methods for resolving conflict. From 1931 to 1934, scores of liberal, radical, and pacifist groups sponsored a series of No More War parades, which grew from 300 participants to more than 20,000. 
Oh, I remember it very vividly because it was quite a hot summer. And it was when the disarmament conference in Washington uh, was failing uh, after the war. And there's quite a lot of material about that, why that was failing. They were about to break up. And the Women's International League internationally felt that something should be done to rescue it. So they asked the sections to do what they could uh, in the way of influencing their governments and collecting signatures. So we had our annual meeting out in California, in Los Angeles. And at the end of the meeting, <clears throat> just at sunset, uh, we, we explained what we were going to do uh, at the end of the finale of that. And uh, just at sunset, we released a whole flock of carrier pigeons. Uh, and they flew up and circled around in the sunset and then started off to Washington. obtained a million and three hundred thousand uh, signatures. Japan has obtained nearly a million. And so from one country to another, they are presented each to, their own, to its own government, hoping to make something of a background of public opinion before the disarmament conference meets in next February. Uh, that was during President Roosevelt period. Uh, and we entered Washington. And we were received at the White House, where we presented the signatures. Uh, and at the dinner that night, uh, Hannah Clothier Hull, who was our national president, presided, and Eleanor Roosevelt was there, and Jane Addis. And in the afternoon, uh, we had a big public meeting in one of the Washington squares in Washington, and Miss Adams initiated the first round the world broadcast. Many of us hope that in course of time, the millions of people who day by day see the newsreel, portraying as they do the inhabitants from every part of the globe, may in time obtain such a sense of identification, such an understanding of various kinds of life, that it will be quite impossible for them to visualize any of these as enemies. People in time will develop a tolerance which will make war impossible. And the old dream for universal peace will come about because the people will no longer tolerate anything else. The Women's International League grew and became active in a variety of areas. They supported the League of Nations, produced educational materials, organized speaking tours, and held more international congresses. In 1934, Dorothy Detzer, a member of the Women's International League, led the push for a congressional investigation into the munitions industry. The findings of that committee exposed vast corruption and made clear the links between war and profit. Well, one of the things which has been most interesting in the peace movement is to which way should it go? Uh, would it go in the way of violence, change conditions, or will it go in the way of nonviolence? Then uh, there's always been, you know, groups that believed in nonviolence or opposed violence. But the really, the great exponent of it was Mahatma Gandhi in India. Uh, when he preached that India must win its freedom, and it caught the attention of the whole world. And when he began with his salt march to the sea, uh, unarmed people marching against what they considered an unjust tax, and he succeeded. It was really quite electrical what it did to all of the people who were not only peace people, but people who were interested in economics and, and in government and in world situation, world history. The example of Gandhi gave tangible evidence of the potential of nonviolent resistance. All in all, it was a time when the work of pacifists was well received, and the hope for a peaceful world seemed like more than a naive dream. The rise of fascism in Europe in the 1930s put pacifism to the ultimate test. Many people who had been proponents of absolute nonviolence took up arms or actively supported others in the fight against fascism throughout Europe. Others still maintain their pacifist positions, arguing that although they unequivocally opposed fascism, violence was not the solution. At the outbreak of the war, the United States section of the Women's International League lost half its membership, equally because it was too pacifist 
and because it was not pacifist enough. Worldwide, members were lost because of persecution, exile, and death. Uh, one of the women was Jelle Herzke from the very famous uh, Viennese music publishing family. Uh, she, she was there and she continued. I visited her later in, in Vienna. Uh, and she was one of the last Jews to leave Vienna after Hitler came in. She and uh, a very good friend of hers who was a Gentile, a musician, uh, were living together in her large house and garden. And after Hitler came in, she was forced to have her friend leave her. Uh, she was also very much under attack, uh, but uh, she told me uh, that she was going to stay till the last minute because she symbolized to the Jews uh, some degree of security. They knew, she knew that after she left, it would be perfectly hopeless for them. Uh, so she stayed and she said she was going to, after she gave up that, she was going to live by introducing long-haired dachshunds and cultivated wild strawberries to the United States. She never actually got here. She got as far as England, however, and did support herself in England. Lita Gustava Heimann uh, was the leader of the German feminist movement and very much closely associated there with, uh, was uh, Dr. Anita Augsburg. One was tall and the other was short and fat. Uh, we used to call them Mutt and Jeff. Uh, uh, Dr. Augsburg had broken into the professions and was the first woman to become a, a doctor in Germany to break in to that. You see, this was what they were trying to do. Uh, and they remained together uh, for all the rest of their lives. They ultimately, of course, were on Hitler's list to be disposed of, uh, and they escaped uh, and ended their lives in Switzerland. Gertrude Baer, uh, was a really remarkable uh, figure. Uh, her father was a banker in Hamburg, uh, but she was a strong feminist. She used to climb out, her mother backed her up, tied that out the window at night, or at least go, go out at night to a, a meeting for a feminist meeting, and uh, her mother would let her in at night. She'd climb in the window. She really kept the international alive. She was not, did not get to the first Congress, but she did kept, really kept it alive by being uh, carrying it on and. She escaped from Germany after Hitler came in. She was on the list to be liquidated. And she brought, they had their last meeting in Cologne on the border. She said goodbye and came over into Switzerland uh, with the list of the WIL with her. Uh, she carried it on all through the war, kept it going. And she then uh, she came to the United States to represent us at the UN and is very largely responsible for the representation of the WIL at the UN. Emily Greenbalch had been on the faculty of Wellesley College and had gotten a leave of absence uh, to go with Miss Adams and work on this. And she succeeded Miss Adams after Miss Adams' death. She succeeded Miss Adams as the international president. Uh, uh, Miss Balch lost her position at Wellesley College because of her work for peace. But she and Jane Adams are the only two American women who have ever received the Nobel Peace Prize. The dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki gave a terrifying new meaning to the concept of war. A whole movement developed to fight nuclear testing and proliferation of nuclear arms. And the most varied contacts are developing between the Soviet Union and America. A delegation of the United States section of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom came to Moscow for the second Soviet-American Women's Conference. After many fruitful discussions, it adopted the United States government focused much of its attention on monitoring the activities of groups like the Women's International League. When people become interested in these issues, which are non-local issues, uh, they have to be prepared for attacks. Now, they happen very differently uh, if there are organizations that are set up to attack them and they are supposed to be un-American, then they, they are subject to great misrepresentation, absolute misrepresentation, really, because they're afraid of them. Uh, the community is afraid of them. They don't know really what they're going to do, so everybody was labeled communist. 
because of the communist movement. It was a great movement, a great new movement. They were terribly afraid of it. They really didn't know what communism was. They didn't know what was going to happen in Russia. Uh, there are all sorts of fears that developed. So anything they didn't understand was labeled communist. So much so, for example, that when I went around, I wouldn't wear a, a red dress or a pink dress even uh, when I was talking. I always took care to wear some conservative color. It was very amusing, too, because it, they passed a law in Massachusetts that you couldn't carry a red flag in a parade, and they ran right into the fact that the students at Harvard were not, then not allowed to carry their Harvard flag when they paraded. <laughs> so it went to really ridiculous limits. Uh, any, any group or any individual that didn't conform to what happened to be the community standards uh, would be attacked. Uh, and so you had to be prepared, if you came into a movement like this, for it and to be maligned and misinterpreted. Well, Wilp has always been a target of the witch hunters. Kay Camp is International Disarmament Coordinator and past international president of the Women's International League. I remember when, at one time, following a seminar here with Soviet women, we were sending the women around to branches throughout the country and our branch hosted three of them. We had an evening here at our home, and uh, many friends, neighbors, and Wilk members came. We had a very good time. They made little speeches. We made little speeches. Took a lot of pictures, and uh, I think everybody felt that it was a very warm and cordial evening. And following that, I wrote to them, and I sent them copies of all those pictures. And I was stunned to learn years later that every one of those pictures turned up, copied in the FBI files, which reported on that evening at our home. And I felt, uh, I felt very personally violated that this was an intrusion similar to the way I felt when uh, we were burglarized and came home to find all our drawers pulled out and the contents strewn about the room and personal valuables missing. And uh, at the same time, it was so ludicrous for them to be reporting on what we ourselves had tried so hard to publicize in the newspapers. If you see me stumble, don't stand back in the corner. He shall now blood. Give your hands to struggle. Give your hands to The civil rights movement left a legacy of nonviolence and direct action to people around the world. The example of black people fighting and resisting became an inspiration for the resurgence of the women's movement and for the enormous mass resistance against the Vietnam War. These overlapping movements clearly demonstrated the relationship between peace and freedom. With the Vietnam War, a dramatic change took place in the tone of anti-war demonstrations. Although signature campaigns and peaceful protests continued, many people were putting their bodies on the line to protest the war. 
One of the important aspects of Wilk through the years has been its uh, desire to go to the source for information, to go to hot spots in the world and get the correct information, both on reconciliation and fact-finding missions uh, from the very first delegations uh, of Jane Addams to, to governments. But I'm talking about crossing borders and uh, one of the first undertaken was after the U.S. Marines landed in Nicaragua and Haiti. Uh, Madame Bouchereau uh, went on several missions to those areas and other areas in the Caribbean and reported back, and uh, we took action to protest those, those interventions. And uh, this has gone on through the years. Uh, Many members went to Vietnam, of course, during Vietnam War, but uh, we had a WILP delegation that was able to go to both South Vietnam and North Vietnam, which was rather unusual. And we found ourselves in the position of taking messages from women from South Vietnam to women of North Vietnam and between families and so forth. It's incredible. And uh, we were also in Laos at that time. One of the outcomes of that was that we worked out and signed, drew up peace treaties with the women between our, our countries. Women, U.S. women and South Vietnamese women, and U.S. women and North Vietnamese women. Um, and that was a very useful tool. Um, later we went to Cuba when it was not encouraged to go. One could not return by way of Mexico City if one went in by Mexico City. So three of us made a point of having to fly to Madrid and then back to the States and held a press conference to say, wasn't this ridiculous? We should be traveling and trading and talking with Cubans. And later it began to happen. We went to Chile um, shortly after the coup. And uh, while two of us would be talking to the government leaders, uh, three or four would be talking to the people in the poblaciones and take, getting very specific information. Uh, it was a, a soul-searing experience because we met with families who had lost members and we found uh, um, victims coming to us secretly because the, uh, the government had published a satirical account of these ladies walking around with their notebooks describing the buckets of blood and so forth. We were able to produce a report and report to the United Nations Human Rights Commission on that and uh, to congressional leaders and we felt that we were helpful in getting congressional legislation to, to stop uh, trade and weapons sales to Chile, although the banks continue to, to do so. Six of us from North, Central, and South America went to Costa Rica, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. We have to focus on the individual countries that are victimized by U.S. foreign intervention and military policy. But when we recognize that there have been 215 such interventions, that is, interventions by the U.S. in third world countries since 1948. Uh, that, that has been going on for generations now. We have to tackle the, the overall problem. And that's going to take a little longer, but we, we're working on it. I didn't, I didn't say much about the, the human contact, but this is, of course, perhaps the most important aspect of these visits. We, we do make personal contact and we do keep in touch and we do get, therefore, in direct information uh, and, uh, and do provide a measure of support and uh, hope for people who are in such desperate circumstances because of our government's dominant desire, necessity to <laughs> dominate other countries of the world.
represents the greatest cross-section of the American people. And we are here joined in one voice to say no to nuclear war and in one voice to say yes to meeting human needs and providing justice for all people in our world. working for 20 years and I've never, never seen anything like this. The world is catching up with us. It's marvelous. This lady is Oh, well, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today and bring greetings to everybody from New Zealand. And I've taken photographs and taken back. Here we have our Kiwi on here. And it, it's tremendous uh, excitement to be amongst so many people for peace, women for peace. And it's so many people on the street. It's wonderful. Oh, isn't it marvelous? And I say that the earlier ones that we took, you know, were little teeny parades. We were ashamed of them because they only showed weakness. So we said we won't parade anymore so we can show strength. So here we are. <laughs> Who are you marching with today? What'd you say? Who are you marching with today? Women's International League for Peace and Freedom.